novelist, a poet, an activist, and a scholar. Uh, professor Mkoma Wambuki is a professor of English at Cornell University in the USA. Now, most importantly, he is the co-founder of Mabati Cornell Prize for African Literature. He also has essays published in uh, journals of World Literature Today and then review books, The World Today, among others. Uh, he was shortlisted for the Game Press for Writing, African Writing in 2009. And uh, last but not least, he is the son of the world renowned theorist and distinguished professor, Gugge Tiongo. With those remarks, gentlemen, let's welcome our Professor Zahanti. Uh, I wanted to begin by reading you a quote from Oprah Winfrey. Um, you, might be, you might know that Oprah Winfrey opened a, a school in South Africa, a $30 million school, right? And then when she was asked uh, why open the school in South Africa, she said, yeah, even why open the school in South Africa as opposed to, let's say, Harlem or you know, in a black community in the United States, she said, okay, if you ask the kids what they want or need, they will say an iPod or some speakers. Miss Winfrey told Music New Magazine referring to visits with students in inner city schools. Can you hear me okay? Because I feel like uh, just making sure because I don't want a single word to be lost. <laughs> no, uh, so she said, uh, in South Africa, they don't ask for money or toys. They ask for uniforms so they can go to school. Right? So already with that example, you can see she's, she's saying, you know, African kids are more industrious and so on and so forth. And referring to African-American kids as wanting iPods and sneakers and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's just a quick quote. Uh, let me now talk a little bit about Maya Angelou. Um, she was in Ghana, as most of you might know. Uh, and I'm referring now here to her book called uh, uh, All God's Children Be Traveling Shoes. Uh, about her time in Ghana in, in the early 1960s. So anyway, she narrates, so she's a black American, she, she's narrating how she went to, uh, now she's in Accra, Ghana, and she's looking for a job. So, as, as a journalist, so she asked an African receptionist at the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, <laughs> whom she should see, right? But she's looking for a job, so, so, she, so she's asking, uh, you know, yeah, who can I talk to to get a job? Um, the conversation turns out to be frustrating, to say the least. The receptionist opening in Salvo is, why don't you know whom you want to see? And after a back and forth, the conversation ends with Angelou telling the receptionist, you silly ass, you can take a plane leap and go straight to hell. To which, <laughs> to which the receptionist prom promptly responds, American Negroes are so crude. Angelou continues, I stood nailed to the floor. Her knowledge of my people could have been garnered from hearsay. And the few old American movies which tuck which black characters as awkwardly as a blinded attached paper to attached paper tails to donkey caricatures. In other words, when the, sec when the African Act Secretary saw Angelou, she seen an image of Angelou as formed by US racism. Angelou thinks more about this and she says, the woman's cruelty activated a response which I developed under the ex ex exacting tutelage of masters. Her brown skin, full lips, white flag nose frills notwithstanding, I had responded to her as if she was a rude white sales clerk in an American department store. But if Angelou's interaction with the African secretary is mediated by whiteness, so is that of, so is that of the secretary, had it been a white man or a woman asking the same questions, you can be sure the receptionist would have ever been helpful, right? And most of us can relate, <laughs> you can relate to this if you go to, uh, I was in South Africa some time back. Um, yeah, and I went to a restaurant, you know, and I waited, nobody came to wait on me then. You know, then I was like, okay, let me just see what's going on. Let me observe. Let me not even say anything. Let me observe, right? Then white families will come, they'll get served. Sometimes we'll have even five waiters, and, you, know, <laughs> you know, serving them. So I just said there, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, what's going on here? What could possibly be going on? Because it's not like the waiters were looking at me and, you know, and with any hatred or, or, or anything like that. It's just that I was completely invisible to them. So and eventually I called the manager because I was hungry. <laughs> I had to stop my observation. <laughs> So, yeah, so I called the manager. The manager, of course, was white, you know, and then the manager called them, and then suddenly I had five black waiters, you know, and then they offered me a free drink for my troubles. Anyway, but, but the point is that there are ways in which, uh, for in this situation with Angelou, right, uh, and this African receptionist, that they're, they're not really seeing each other, right? They're not really seeing each other because for Angelou, and generally for African Americans growing up in the US, they are taught very negative images of Africa. The same images we complain about, you know, the Africa of starvation, the Africa of war, the Africa of hunger, and you know, the Africa of 
you know, occasional bloodletting and so on and so forth, you know, uh, unpoliticized violence. Conversely, for the, uh, for the African secretary, she, she has seen Angelou through the eyes of racism as well. Like she has seen Angelou as a, well, as, as a person who, you know, the same stereotypes we have about African Americans that we get, we get through the media. You know, they're lazy, they don't take advantage of the American dream, they're violent, they're vulgar, they're loud, and so on and so forth, right? So in a way, when they were looking at each other, it was a simple look at each other through at each other through the veil of racism. Uh, to give you a quick, a quick personal example, right? You know, so I was just, then I just uh, started school, college at Albright College uh, in Pennsylvania, and this was the first semester. So I mean, we're, you know, we're first year. What do first years do? We party, right? <laughs> well, I don't know about here, but uh, yeah, but you know, that's what you do as a freshman, as, as a first year student. So, so I was at this party, and uh, I'm standing by a keg of beer. And uh, an African American fellow student, who's also a first year, came up to me, and she and he asked me, "Where are you from?" Uh, and I said, uh, "No, he asked me, are you from Africa?" Then I said, "Yeah, but really, I'm from Kenya, you know, because Africa is not a country, as they say." Uh, then he asked me, "Do you live on trees?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, and you know, and I was so angry, right? I was so angry, you know. And we started yelling at each other. You know, we've never met before. We're strangers, right? We're, before that moment, we never met before. We are strangers, and yet we are, we, are, we are at each other's throats. And what happened immediately after that, before actually now we could you know, start fighting, uh, an older, I guess a second year, I think she was a second year, uh, African-American student, you know, came, came and gave us a call and talking to, right? You know, she's like, hey, can't you see you guys, you're just acting out racism. I mean, she was so angry, right? You know, because, you know, for she could see what we're doing, right? You know, but for us, of course, you know, um, we couldn't. Um, so I often, go, I often go back to that moment because I'm interested in my reaction. Like, why was, why was I more angry at him, right? Uh, in ways that I wouldn't have if he was a, a white student. You know, and part of it has to do with, even though, you know, there is that sort of tension, right? Even though there is that sort of tension, there's also a need between the two, the, the, the two, the two groups, uh, African Americans or Black Americans and Africans to connect, right? So it's almost, um, let, let me put it this way, yeah, if a stranger insults you, you're like, well, okay, sure. You know, but if, if a relative does, your reaction is different, right? It's more, it's more cutting and more deep in. So, so, so in addition to thinking about why, uh, and, and reasoning that because we are seeing each other through the eyes of racism, that's why we almost came to blows. Then I've spent some time now looking deeper into that. In fact, if you argue my last, um, you know, my last, I don't know, 30 years or so, I have been thinking through that moment. Actually, right now I'm working on, I'm, I'm writing a, a book called um, Somewhere Between Black and African, where I'm thinking through these issues. Anyway, so there are several things that divide Africans and African Americans, right? And, and I, I'll talk about the solidarity as well, because it's a contradiction, right? And the biggest one that I've found is the question of slavery, right? Uh, there's always the question of who sold who, right? Uh, where African Americans will argue that, uh, that it's Africans who sold them into slavery. Uh, then Africans will say, no, we didn't sell them into slavery. Uh, in fact, we aren't Africans, you know, we were, you know, we were nations. Uh, and more pointedly, if you think about this question, you can go back to a debate between Henry Louis Gates. Uh, Henry Louis Gates, you know Henry Louis Gates, right? He's, a, he's an African American scholar based at Harvard, right? Uh, he did a documentary, he came and traveled all over, all over the continent. Uh, and one of the one of the episodes uh, was on slavery, right? And then of course you know Ali Mazri, right? Uh, Ali Mazri he had also done a trilogy uh, called um, the Triple Heritage, right? So anyway, uh, so Ali Mazri accused Gates uh, of saying that his television series uh, virtually tells the world the world that the West has no case to answer. Africans sold each other. Presumably, if, if, if there to be any reparations in the transatlantic slave trade, you talk to me from the Africans to Africans, right? Then he goes on, Skip Gates succeeded in getting an African to say that without the role, that without the role of Africans in facilitating it, that there will be no transatlantic slave trade at all. To this, Gates responded, the role of African collaboration in the slave trade, though hardly a major part of my film series, is anguishing to me. He must really displays no, major, no such anguish. While intellectually, I know that the kingdoms engaged in war and sold, uh, I'm gonna steal somebody's phone. <laughs> I, uh, well, intellectually, I know that kingdoms engaged in war and sold their enemy captives are to Europeans, and that they do not think of these captives as fellow Africans. 
Still, I wonder when the king of Damo hit, forced his slaves to march around the tree of forgetfulness six times, counterclockwise, so that they would forget those who had enslaved them in the, into the horrors they would face in, on the Middle Passage and in the New World, so that their souls would not return to Dahomey to haunt the guilty. He asks, does it sound as though those in Africa were unaware of the depth of suffering that the New World slavery held? Does it not suggest they felt guilty about it? You decide, but don't ask me not to wonder what in the world was on these brothers' minds when they sold other black people to these strange Europeans. You know, so you can see these, these are the top scholars. These are, you know, these are the top uh, African, well, African and African American scholars. You know, and they can't reconcile themselves around uh, the question of who sold who. So, in reading my Angelou's book, the one that I referenced earlier, she narrates how she's in Ghana now, right? And she's about to leave Ghana, to Germany, wherever, right? And she decides to take a tour in northern Ghana. Uh, so she does that. She gets to a bridge somewhere, right? She gets to a bridge. There's a village up above in front of it. She gets to a bridge. And she talks about how she can't cross that bridge, right? You know, she just starts shaking and so on and so forth. Anyway, they get across the bridge, you know, and uh, there's some women at the market who start yelling you know, and crying when they see her, right? So, so what was happening there, according to her, is that this was a village, I was there actually, I'll tell you about it, uh, it's, it's a village called Keta in, uh, in Ghana. So according to her, this was a village that had been raided for slaves, right? So this was a village that had been devastated uh, for slaves, and when they saw her, right, you know, she, in, the, in the bush she says they are tall, uh, it was a they were seeing her returning, right? Of course, you know, it's not, I'm assuming they, they're not, it's not literal, right? They're not saying this is really your child who has come back, it's more of a symbolic, right? of a symbolic, um, uh, in, in the book I'm reading, I call it a symbolic, a symbolic morning, right? Uh, because this, ability, this is a village that was raided, so maybe let's say 60, 70% of its population uh, was, was taken off as slaves. Then how does a community, um, how does a community heal itself, right? After suffering, suffering such trauma, that's, that's, the, that's the question at the heart of it all, right? So this was a village then, that over time had been inheriting this trauma, passing it on from generation to generation, right? And or oh, Angelo, at the same time, she has questions, you know, that she needs answers for. Um, so in a way, in a way, it's a thing they help each other mourn, mourn, right? Because part of, you know, part of the cruelty of slavery is that uh, unlike having a dead body which you can bury and mourn, you know, and so on and so forth, but slavery people just disappear, right? So you end up in a, in these communities. Uh, in a space of suspended, <laughs> suspended mourning, right? Um, but anyway, so, so, so it's good to keep in mind, but I'm bringing this uh, up to, to try to resolve the question of who sold, right? To, add, to answer that question, really, you should talk about the communities that were devastated by slavery, to say that uh, suffering, I, I'm not trying to compare suffering, but suffering was on both sides, you know, right? the people who were, the villages who were raided really were left in mourning, uh, that they can never complete, and then of course the, the slaves who, uh, you know, got to, to experience the trauma. Um, just a quick aside before I move on. Um, so, yeah, so, so, yeah, so when I go to Keta, uh, now it's a town, it's a very small town, depopulated. I don't know, I, maybe it, it was me, you know, uh, projecting my own assumptions you know, after reading my angel. But it looked like a very depressed town, right? Uh, there's a fort, a slave fort there uh, in Keta. It has also been eaten by the sea, by the Atlantic, right? It's coming in and uh, eating up the town. Uh, and since we're in a church, let me mention this just, you know, because I wrote about it in Twitter. <laughs> but um, what, the most fascinating thing that I saw, in addition to other horrors, was that for every fort, I went to maybe like four or five forts, for every fort, there's a dungeon where the slaves were kept in appalling condition, right, where most of them died and so on and so forth. On top of that, literally, on top of the dungeon, there will be a church, right? This is without any... It is not, the church is a few, a few meters away, it's not a kilometer away. It literally, it's built on top of this dungeon. Uh, so you have, then you have the church, then you have the, um, I don't know, like a ballroom where they'll do dances and, and, and trade. <laughs> and then on top of that, you have a mansion. Uh, not a mansion, but you have, I don't know, like a big apartment where the governor lived. Uh, yeah, so, so with, with, the, with these unresolved, uh, unresolved uh, historical questions, with the two people seeing themselves through the eyes of racism, a perceived competition of shrinking resources, tension in communities that house both Africans and African Americans have been on the rise. You know, so, so in the US, 
there, there's a lot of tension, uh, even on my own campus, right, at Cornell, there's a lot of tension between Africans and African Americans because what, who sold who, right? And then now, they, they, then here the Africans, they're coming in, uh, you know, they're taking jobs. <laughs> then part of the other argument is that uh, the Africans who now are in the US uh, did not suffer through the civil rights struggles, right? So, so, so the argument is, yeah, they come, they take the jobs. Uh, at the same time, uh, they did not suffer through the struggle. Um, you know, and then the Africans on the other hand, uh, like, well, yeah, again, it's the same stereotypical thing, right? So for the Africans, you know, then they'll say, well, you know, it's too bad you guys are not taking advantage of, uh, you know, of your own resources, you know, of what we're doing in parents and so forth. But when you look at, when, when you look at, when, when, you look at the two, when you look at the two communities, right? There are ways in which the African immigrant, the first generation African immigrant, or myself, for example, right? Uh, there are ways in which they're becoming a buffer between uh, the black Americans and uh, the white population, right? So you end up with a, I don't know if you've heard the term the Asian model minority. It referred to how the Asian immigrants in the US uh, were seen as a model minority. They're hardworking. You know, they take advantage of resources and so on and so forth. And they behave well, of course, right? <laughs> you know, so, so there are ways in which the, the African immigrant has been put in that position of being the model immigrant. And if you're interested in these questions, you can follow up. Just Google uh, Ivy League acceptances of Africans or something, and you'll see how uh, every, 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 every year there'll be headlines that say, so and so, you know, Diambo, you know, there'll be an African name admitted to all Ivy League schools. And then there'll be an insinuation in that article that this kid, you know, this black kid did well. Um, as an immigrant, what was what, what's wrong then with the black Americans, right? So there are ways in which then, um, you know, that they're, they're, they're being used um, as a buffer. You know, there's something, in another essay I, I wrote in for The Guardian called um, uh, African African American. I use the term foreigner privilege, right? Meaning that, of course, meaning that if I get shot by a cop, you know, of course if I get shot, it, 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 then it would matter at that point, right? You know, but generally, like Amadou Diallo, I mean, he was an immigrant who got shot. But generally speaking, there is a foreigner privilege where if, let's say, I get stopped by a cop and they hear my accent, right? I can get away with things that an, an African American would. And then, of course, that translates into jobs and so on and so forth, right? Um, you know, there's an incident that Kofi Annan, the late Kofi Annan, with somebody who writes about him. And he's talking about how, she's talking about how Kofi Annan went to the South during the civil rights struggle. You know, and he went to a barber, he went to get, to get a haircut. Uh, when he went to get a haircut, he went to a white barber uh, who, well, on seeing him say, I don't cut nigger hair, right? I don't cut hair, the hair belonging to niggers. At, at which point then Kofi Annan said, no, I'm not a nigger, I'm an African, right? And then, and then, and then of course, his hair was cut. Right, <laughs> you know, so um, so so even from that example, you can see instead of him, instead of him saying no, I was not in solidarity with my, you know, brothers and sisters, you know, I won't get my hair cut. Right, he uses it. It's a loophole, if you will. He uses the foreign privilege to get away with it. Anyway, with my friends, we used to joke that if you get stopped by a policeman, you know, uh, you know, deepen your accent. Make it as deep as you can, right? <laughs> and then eventually the cop will say, yeah, we don't know these things here. You can go. Uh, so, and if, if you're thinking about this divide, and if you see it in, in its, uh, in its uh, I guess, manifested form, uh, you can think about how we talk about Obama, right? Uh, Obama is a Kenyan. Uh, in fact, at some point, you're supposed to say he's not, uh, he's not a, a, a senator from Kenya. Uh, but he's Kenyan, there's a senator beer, right? There's a senator beer. Um, and most Africans would see him as an African, right? And for most black Americans, they see him as a black American. Like there's no, you know, there are ways in which we could have used him uh, as, as a vehicle for us to talk to each other, right? But each, each, part takes, each part takes what they want, and then, you know, it doesn't facilitate conversation. Um, though it turned out he was, he was a president for neither, right? He, was, he wasn't a president for Africa or <laughs> president for African Americans. Um, but, you know, so I can give you a quick, a quick personal example of, uh, of this divide. So when I first went to the US, I lived in New Jersey, you know, amongst uh, a Kenyan, mostly, you know, we hanged out amongst Kenyans. At some point, somebody opened a Kenyan bar in East Orange. East Orange is a black American neighborhood. And uh, so we'd go there, you know, 
and would have beers there, dance, whatever, listen to Kenyan music without any interaction with the community in which the, uh, uh, in which the bar is set. Um, so the African Americans would come in. I don't know every now and then there would be a few words exchanged, you know. But one day a fight ended up breaking out, right, between the Africans and the, well, in this case, between the Kenyans and the African Americans at, the, uh, at that bar. You know, again, yeah, all these things, you can get around these incidences. But what is interesting, though, is that in spite of these tensions, there has been a history of a great solidarity between Africans and African Americans. And now I'll talk about that and then um, talk about the, I don't know, the pitfalls of, of all this. Um, so, African and African American struggles have a strong history of solidarity. One cannot think of Pan Africanism without thinking about W.E.B. Du Bois in as much as one cannot think about African American struggle without thinking of him. His concept of double consciousness, to be inhabited by two consciousness, consciousnesses that are opposed to each other became a tool to look at the African American psyche. What in Africa becomes a colonized mind. Pan Africanism became a way of locating black people in the world, indeed a way for them to reclaim their place, their place in the world. You know, and of course, the boy is interesting. Uh, he's an African American scholar, a Pan African, uh, who ended up moving to Ghana. Uh, with his wife, Charlie Du Bois, uh, I believe in the, in the late 50s. Uh, you know, and he, started, he started doing an encyclopedia of, uh, of black history. Anyway, he ended up dying there, right? He ended up dying there, getting buried there. And same thing with his, with his wife years later. Um, so that's one example. Or oh, take Martin Luther King Jr., right? When we think about Martin Luther King, at least, if, now that we're talking about the Black History Month, when we think about Martin Luther King, at least in the U.S., it's, it's, a, very, uh, it's a very watered down version of Martin Luther King, right? I mean, he's used to sell hamburgers. Okay, maybe it's not that bad, you know, you know, but, you know but his image is used you know, to sell, I don't know, IBM computers, blah, 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 right there. There is in which he has been uh, de-radicalized, right? Uh, but Martin Luther King, but, they, 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 but there's also the Martin Luther King of the Poor People's Coalition. He, he, he referred to himself as a democratic socialist. Um, you know, you know, he was also uh, one of the one of one of the major voices to start talking about sanctions against apartheid in South Africa, right? You know, so uh, so in a, in, a, in a 1964 London speech, uh, MLK said he said that um, clearly clearly there is much in Mississippi and Alabama to remind South Africans of their own country. Yet even in Mississippi, we can organize religious and liberal voters. We can speak to the press. We can ensure organize the people in nonviolent action. But in South Africa, even the mildest form of nonviolent resistance meets with years of imprisonment, and leaders over many years have been restricted and silenced and imprisoned. We can understand how, in that situation, people feel felt so desperate that they turn to other methods such as sabotage. Right? And when you read that passage carefully, he's not denouncing because at that point the ANC, right, the ANC had adopted. Um, the arms struggle them got to a scene where, right? So when you listen to that person here, he's not denouncing it. He's saying that while, and, and, and elsewhere, that while he himself would advocate for non-violence, right? Uh, he can see how, he, we, we can understand how, in that situation, people felt so desperate that they turned to other methods such, such as sabotage. Anyway, he goes on. When it is realized that Great Britain, France, and other democratic powers also propped up the economy of South Africa, and when to all of this is added the fact that the USSR has indicated its willingness to participate in a boycott, it is proper to wonder how South Africa can so confidently defy the civilized world. The conclusion is inescapable that it is less sure of its own power, but more sure that the great nations will not sacrifice trade and profit to effectively oppose them. The shame of our nation is that it is objectively an ally of this monstrous government in its grim war with its own black people. Right? Uh, then you can think about other contributions between Afri Africans and African Americans. Black power, black consciousness, right? Uh, you know, you can think of the Mafia Convention through black liberation theology. You know, you can think about the Black Panthers who find refuge in Tanzania and Algeria. Uh, you can think about organizations such as Africa Action, which is a primarily African American organization in the U.S. that supports, uh, that lobbies for Africa's interests or Trans-Africa Forum, again, again, a primarily African-American organization. You know, that, and this, when Ronald Reagan would not declare sanctions against South Africa, when he would say what he, what he wanted was constructive engagement, which was to say he wanted to continue trading, right? 
uh, it was the Americans who, who lobbied, uh, who, you know, uh, who protested, right, uh, on behalf of that. And in fact, when Mandela was released, and he, he came to the U.S. at some point. And just a quick note, Mandela was kept on the terrorist list. He was a terrorist, according to the uh, official in the U.S. until like 2002. But anyway, when he came to the U.S., he did credit uh, African Americans with the uh, credit uh, them for leading to the downfall of apartheid, right? So there are a lot of examples, um, but, but there are three things uh, that I want to mention here quickly. Uh, then also other little things, that, that good Marshall, you know, the Supreme Court, the late Supreme Court Justice of the, in the U.S., an African American, uh, was also an advisor when Kenya was doing his constitution in 1962. He was one of the advisors, right? Um, but let me give you some gossipy stuff because it's interesting. So, uh, how many of you remember uh, Julius Gekonyo Miano? Right? He was a minister at some point. Yeah, he was, I, think, I think he's the first, Kenyan, the first Kenyan to get a PhD. Right? He bent me to it. Okay, no, I'm really joking. <laughs> no, he's not the first Kenyan to get a PhD. Uh, he went to Lincoln University, right? At Lincoln University, he was dating. Uh, Coretta, Coretta Scott King, of course, before she became, you know, King, right? And uh, then later he married, uh, he said, you know, according to the, whatever, you know, the writers, uh, she rejected him because he was too political. Well, I mean, it depends on who's writing the story, though. <laughs> you know? Uh, but later he married uh, a, a nurse, an African-American nurse called Ernestine, you know, uh, Ernestine, she became Ernestine Keanu, right? So they moved, they came to Kenya, um, you know, when they came to Kenya, she denounced American citizenship. There's a good photograph from the nation, from I think it was 1960 something, of, of Keanu, Anistin, you know, holding up now her Kenyan passport, right? Uh, but what happens is, and the way I read it, she was too much of a feminist, right? She was too much of a fe feminist, and she ended up um, running afoul of, I don't know, the patriarchal powers, you know, that, that we're all familiar with. Um, because of that, she ended up being stripped of her Kenyan citizenship uh, and deported, right? Deported back to the U.S. Now, when she was in Kenya, she started Mandela. You know Mandela Yawanawake, right? Mm -hmm. And so she was one of the architects of Mandela Yawanawake, right? So what happened was, after she got kicked out of the country, uh, now what's her name? Jane Kiano, right? The, 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 she became the wife, right? Yeah, so, so then, yeah, so then Kiano married Jane Kiano, and then Jane Kiano became the chair of the Mandela Yawanawake which became a tool of the government, right? Any disagreements? <laughs> yeah, 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 so, um, so, but I'm saying all this to capture maybe the more, you know, I, I have spent hours looking at that photograph, right, because it's a time of hope, right? Imagine if Kenya had continued, right, on, on that part of, a, of, of, I don't know, a practical Pan-Africanism and also ideological Pan-Africanism, right? What a different country would have. Um, you know, so, but overall though, I do not think, and, 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 and that example of Malcolm X being here, not, us not knowing about it, uh, I do not think overall that Africa has generally recognized the role African Americans have played in the liberation of Africa. So, this is a quote from the, the, the then president of Senegal, uh, uh, one day, right? So he wrote an open for the New York Times uh, called To Our Diaspora Africa Awakening, in which he says, in part, for much, of the, for much of the past half century, the role that African Americans play in Africa has been more lip service and rhetorical filter than reality. That is about to change, right? I've just given a few examples, you know, to show that really nothing could be further than the truth, you know. Then he says, um, without much notice in the United States, Africa and the role that African Americans can play in promoting its development is undergoing a profound transformation. Uh, and this was in 2007. In the past, the connection between African, African African Americans and the African continent was largely an accident of history. Not only did African Americans come to the United States in change centuries earlier, but the civil rights movement in America came to fruition at the same time as Africa's quest for independence. Right? So, <laughs> you know, it's, it, 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 I don't know what to say, <laughs> you know, because it, it, nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, uh, I mentioned Malcolm X, when Malcolm X came, right, he had come with the whole idea of, uh, of going to, to, to lobby the uh, the then Organization of African Unity to treat the question of black Americans as an issue of human rights, right? As opposed to civil rights. So he was, 
his argument was get, get the, the Africans to go along with the United Nations now uh, and talk about the racism against African Americans as a human rights issue. So it becomes an international, so it becomes an international struggle, right? Um, you know, that, that he also went to Ghana, Egypt, and so on and so forth. Um, so, so in all that to say that there has been solidarity, right? There has been solidarity between uh, struggling Africans. I can give you another quick example. Saul Plage, uh, who was a South African activist and also writer, uh, in the early 1900s, traveled all the way to the US uh, to, lobby for, uh, to lobby for black Africans in South Africa. He met with Big Boy and people like Marcus Garvey and so on and so forth. So, so, so it's not the first, it's not for lack of example, right? Um, okay, one more fact, then I'll continue. So, what is interesting about Malcolm X when, when he was in Kenya is that he met with Biogama Pinto, right? Uh, they were both killed, assassinated within four days of each other, right? I mean, not to say, I'm not trying to come up with a conspiracy theory here, you know, but those are the times they lived in, right? The more radical you became, right? The more, uh, the more you risk, you know, the more you, know, the more you risk assassination. So, but I'm fascinated by why, this is not my theory, I'm fascinated by why then, if we have this uh, history of solidarity, why it's not known, and why then I, in 1990, would be at a party, right? Would be at a party somewhere fighting somebody who has me, an African American who has me feeling on trees. You know, and, and, and I blame that on how we have approached change, you know, how we talk about change. So we've always seen political change as a top down, as a top down, uh, as a top-down affair, right? If you think of W. E. Du Bois, Du Bois, he had come up with the, the idea of the talented tenth, and the idea of the talented tenth, yeah, you get the top, I guess, the top ten percentile of your population. That's, you know, and then that, then you use that ten percent to lead, and then to bring everybody else up. If you look at Marxism, they use the vanguard theory, right? The vanguard theory also has that sort of connotation. Right? It's a small group of people leading uh, the, the, the masses into, well, into. into a, 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 a revolutionary future. Uh, if you think about the French Revolution, the same thing. There's a term that the poet, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, uses, where he talks about um, change being brought about by a small, glorious band of men, right? So, and, and, and if, if you keep that model, then it means that, 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 that the leadership is not organically coming from the people to begin with, right? And at the same time, there's always a risk of a, of a small uh, group of glorious men. Uh, and, it's, it, it, and we can talk about the gender issue when it comes to political change and revolutionary change. Uh, then it's always a, a question of a small glorious band of men then leading, uh, uh, leading, uh, leading the change. So what have been the cause of some of these things? Right? Have, have been invisible to each other? Uh, Malcolm X understood the cause of our invisibility to each other. In a speech given at the University of Ghana in 1964, he said of Africa, this, the most beautiful continent that I've ever seen, is the richest continent I've ever seen, and strange as it may seem, I find many white, white, white Americans here smiling in the faces of our African brothers, like they have been loving them, loving them all the time. It was saying with humor, so people laughed. Um, the fact is, these same whites who in America spit in, your, in our faces, the same whites who in America club us brutally, just because we want to integrate with them, are over here in Africa smiling in your face, trying to integrate with you. But actually, what they want to integrate with is the wealth that they know is here. The untapped natural resources which exceed the wealth of any continent on this earth today, right? Uh, because we are invisible to each other, we do, not, we do not see we are fundamentally in the same situation. African labor and wealth is being siphoned out of the continent. African American labor and wealth is being siphoned out of their communities. The prison industrial complex for African Americans is a return to slave labor, and black youth in the U.S. have been criminalized in order to feed this machine. We cannot see how, we cannot see new forms of exploitation being built on old forms of exploitation. So globalization has seen an increase of wealth and the potential to eradicate extreme poverty. Yet we're seeing a growing divide where poorer nations and the poor within them are getting poorer, and the wealthy nations and the, and the rich within them are getting richer. There is a saying that there is a saying that uh, actually African, African Americans like to use that okay when uh, when America sneezes, black America catches a cold. Well, <laughs> well, America comes to Africa for her medicine, leaving Africans with the cold. So I've already talked about um, about my fear of uh, of African, African immigrants becoming a buffer between uh, African Americans and white Americans, and I talk about the foreigner privilege. 
Um, oh yeah, so let me skip that. You know, so and, and then just briefly before before I conclude, so what happens for most you know African immigrants when they move to the U.S. and you know and they have um, they have you know they have families and so on and so forth they move their families they tell their children because they're they're coming from Africa where they they're grown up with the stereotypes of African Americans they tell them quite explicitly not to play or to interact with African Americans right um, so at the same time though. Because of that, they end up with children who are neither African American or African, right? you know, because, you know, for many reasons, for economic reasons, for example, you, you can't come to Kenya all the time with your family, right? It's just too expensive. Uh, secondly, maybe somebody is there illegally, so in any case, they can't, even if they wanted to, even if they had the money, they can't come back. So, so you end up with a, with, a, with, a, with a household that has two different cultures, right? You know, because the kids are growing up in the US. Uh, in fact, uh, a few years ago, uh, my father and I were invited by a youth organization in Seattle, a Kenyan youth organization in Seattle, uh, because um, they say that, you know, that they felt their generation of first, first generation Africans in the, in the U.S., uh, you know, were falling out of, I don't know, I guess out of the rail tracks, you know, so they were doing drugs, leaving school, and so on and so forth. Uh, but part of it, of course, is that the, the, the same parent who will tell their children not to play with African Americans doesn't mean that then they give them, then they tell them, okay, now I'm going to teach you your language. You know, I'll make sure you go to your country once a year and visit with your grandparents, right? Uh, because if you, if you disdain African Americans, then you also disdain a part of your own culture, right? It's, it's, it's the same movement, right? So, so, anyway, so then they end up with, a, with, a, with that sort of a family situation. So I had a friend of mine, you know, we actually we were talking and he said that, his, that at some point his son was angry at him, an American-born son who told him, yeah, you might be African, but you don't know what it means to be African-American, right? So not only do we Africans here need to extend our imaginations, our political imaginations, you know, and learn more about the African-American struggles, but for the Africans in the U.S. as well, they need to do that. Uh, So I don't know. So, so my, let me conclude by saying that um, that if we if we accept solidarity is necessary, and it, and it is not, it's not even that it's necessary. If if we agree, we'll honour uh, those that who have died for the struggles of Africans and African Americans, right? Malcolm X, Pilgrim, and so on and so forth. Then, by definition, we need to pick up each other's struggles, right? Um, right now in the U.S., uh, there's a lot of. Uh, uh, police killings. I don't know why we don't call them extrajudicial killings. I mean, the ways in which the U.S. uses very nice language, <laughs> you know. So police killings, but really, if that was happening in Kenya, we call them state-sanctioned extrajudicial killings and so on and so forth of young black men, right? Uh, in the U.S., there is the industrial uh, military. Uh, they, they call it. Of course, the military industrial complex. But there is what Angela Davis calls the prison industrial complex, which is uh, the incarceration for very small petty crimes uh, of, of black youth. Uh, who then are put into private prisons. I mean, yeah, they, they, the, prison, the, the prison industry has been largely privatized, right? And then they're used for labor, right? You know, they're used for cheap labor, you know, they're underpaid, and so on, if you can call it being underpaid. Um, on the other hand, if those are the, just to mention a few of the struggles in the US, on the other hand, we can think about, for example, the US foreign policy uh, in Africa, the use of drone warfare, the, I don't know if you've heard of AFRICOM, the African Command Center, uh, which now I think is operating, it's a US, US African Command Center, which is operating in quite a number of countries. Um, so in, in other words, uh, solidarity is formed in struggle. We have to adapt each other's causes, and in the discussions that ensue, solidarity, solidarity work will help strengthen our bond. This should be the, re the rallying call for African and African Americans. Um, Solidarity, Pan-Africanism, is to be forged through action. Thank you. Now, um, I don't want to sound like I'm, 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 I'm uh, summarizing the complex arguments that um, Prof has um, uh, given before us, but um, maybe just one or two um, uh, issues. Of course, Prof has talked about Black African and the or African American and the African, and uh, in this talk, he's trying to weave theory, you know, uh, personal experiences, 
and historical facts in this presentation. And before I open uh, for questions, maybe I'll, I'll take the privilege, I don't know what to call it, what privilege, <laughs> um, and ask just uh, one or two questions. But the first one um, is about uh, what, what you think in your estimation is the place of history in the study of, uh, let's say, communications or uh, journalism or even creative writing. And here I'm asking on behalf of our students, who most of them are you know, taking journalism, communication, and other courses. So what do you think is the role of history? And uh, bear in mind, uh, you have drawn deep from the world of history in your presentation. And uh, I'd also be curious among the, the audience, you know, how many of us have ever visited, visited the National Archives? You know? So perhaps you can talk about that. And the second question, um, you know, most young people want to pay um, uh, you know, African Americans, but just maybe to put it more bluntly, most uh, young people I know behave as if they are uh, African American, you know. But from experience, you know, having grown up in Kenya, of course, born in the US, grown, grown up in Kenya, going to Tigoli, and a few high schools around, um, what was there a shock for you when you go to the US and then you, you, you began to discover? Um, you know, who you are, something like that. Thank you. So maybe you can respond to that, then you can take a few more uh, questions. Oh, it's certainly, it's certainly, history has a, has a, has a, has a, a large role to play in journalism. Because you, you can't know what questions to ask if you don't know the history. For example, I give the example of Malcolm X. So if you don't know Malcolm X was here, and you're right to say his uh, anniversary, his uh, assassination anniversary, right? Then, then it's, uh, you'll be writing about a truncated history, right? Um, you know, I like to talk about Martin Luther King in Ghana. Um, again, if you're interested, you're writing about, let's say, the, the police killings of young men, uh, black men and women uh, in, uh, in, in, in the U.S. Uh, again, if you don't like, let me put it this way, I don't think you can be a good journalist without a, a, a deep history not just history, I think philosophy as well. Um, you know, literature, cultural, cultural criticism. Because what you're doing is, it's as if you're taking all these knowledges and distilling it and giving it to the people, right? And chances are, the journalists here reach more people, <laughs> you know, than me, right? You know? um, so I, I do think it's important that, that actually, in a communication department such as this, uh, to offer philosophy courses, uh, literary courses, cultural criticism, and even courses that deal with history. And, and it's critical of all of us, actually. I mean, back in the day, the, 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 there was no division between the, 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 the academic disciplines. Everything was philosophy. Um, my question has to do with the fact that uh, you mentioned about that, I mean, the history of people like uh, Malcolm X in town, um, Coretta Scott King. And I think, I just wanted to ask, do you think it's a an issue of only black history because I mean you all and I'm sure if I was to tell people here that the Beatles performed in Kenya in the fifties, nobody will be like oh did they but did they perform? Yeah they performed oh. the Camille Cinema. Yeah. Uh, uh, but they were not as big as you know as they are now. Oh well, the president of the US came on a safari and killed a lot of animals. Um, I think Theodore Roosevelt. So we have a history of all the lot of things happen in Kenya, and uh, we find that a lot of those things get lost along the way. So I don't know why we need to worry that it's only Kenyan or black history that vanishes along the way. Because the things that the, the people who are in the, the powers that be, they, they keep alive the history, the things they say, think are important to us. Like for instance, we all know that Queen Elizabeth went up a tree and came down and she went down uh, up a prison, as a princess and came down as a queen. Uh, it's an urban legend that she became a queen when she was in Nyeri somewhere. So the things which we, <laughs> so we all know this. So that, or somebody apparently, one of the royal family members, had a honeymoon here or the, some, we all know those things. Yeah. So is it, is it really a, merely a fact of uh, that it's only black uh, or African Americans who are not we don't know much about or we don't know much about any of the other people. So um, maybe we want to ask: Are we 
uh, should we be blaming the uh, we don't know because it's not just the African people. Yeah. We, we don't know that uh, Oliver Tambo was arrested at JKA. Mm -hmm. Most people don't know that. He had to run free. Yeah, that's my question. Yeah, so I mean, right. yeah, sure. Yeah, so my 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 question would be that um, that okay, so unless I'm a music historian, right? That the bit of Spain, okay, it's good to know, it's good to know, but it doesn't change my consciousness, my political consciousness, right? Though I could, I mean, you know, you could, I mean, you could make an argument for it, but let me put it that way. Whereas knowing that, um, yeah, that Oliver Town was arrested at the United States, or knowing that uh, Malcolm X met with Pierre Pierre Pinto, uh, will lead us to ask questions that then will allow us to see uh, the real history, right? You're right in, in, in that the history that's handed down to us. Uh, it is a, it's a watered down, uh, it's a big test, it's a big test, it's not even a big test, you know, because there's an argument to be made that what the Kenyatta government did immediately after independence was to bury the history of the Mau Mau, right? Uh, so, so, so we've grown up with that sort of sanitized history, I mean, you know, you know and you can argue with this, you know, where Kenyatta did denounce the Mau as terrorists, you know, before the time became popular. Right? Uh, so, so it's a question of, of a, a history that could potentially change how we see ourselves and how we see our country being denied and, and, and suppressed, right? You know? And then part of it is also, you know, why not celebrate it? Why not celebrate something that, uh, you know, something as, as, as great as, you know, Malcolm X was in Kenya? Um, if we don't know that, then we can't ask. For example, we should be asking, really, the question really we should be asking is what was the conversation between Malcolm X and Pio Pinto? Uh, we should be asking, what, where is the speech he gave at the party? Right? You know, so, so, so starting with this little knowledge of, yeah, Malcolm X was here, then we'll be as if you ask him different, different, different questions. Okay, yeah. Why was uh, Pierre Gomez-Bito assassinated? Did he have anything to do with Malcolm X? Why was Malcolm X assassinated? Did he have anything to do with his internationalism? So, so I'll say, you know, I, I, for myself, I'll say it's very, very crucial for, for an, an understanding of ourselves. You know, and then if you keep repeating history, the history of being handed down, and then we keep repeating the history that from the 1963, you know, uh, you know that, that has been handed down by the you know Kenyatta's and Moise and so on and so forth. Then how can we, if we don't understand the depth of our exploitation and its historical roots, then how can we hope to change the society we are in? Thank you for that. Um, I welcome. Brief, brief questions or comments. So we have a comment question. Uh, we have Roslyn, then I saw another hand up. You made an interesting comment that we and the African American are invisible to each other. I find that a paradox in this way. Whereas them on the other side, they are able to understand how we live. Our children on this side want to do music like them, talk like them, wear sneakers like them, and we assume, identify in every way with their brothers on the other side. I find that quite a paradox. We struggle to see fellow Africans as part of us, probably because of the diversity of our languages, and not just people outside our countries, even amongst us. We first of all think of each other in terms of the first language that you speak, you are Luya, you are Kukuyu. So we struggle, I think that has been a long struggle of identity. So language has its blessing, but we've not been able as Africans to harness that blessing in terms of that diversity that can be our strength. It often becomes a point of contradiction for us. Maybe you can say something about that. Yeah, so, 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 so he doesn't get lost in me and she has some good points. Yeah, so in terms of um of, of yeah of, 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 of African youth and hip you know and uh can you imitating and I use my imitating deliberately, imitating hip hop, right? Um it it, it doesn't what what they, they should go ask let me put it this they should go ask their father, right? And, and and look at the and, and look at the political question. So, so it doesn't become a, so it doesn't become a fashion statement, right? So it doesn't become being cool, right? So so it comes with the with the high degree of a of a political 
consciousness, you know, uh, and the historical relationship between Africa and South America. So, um, my, my, my own understanding of this question is that actually it's African Americans who have done more uh, for Africa struggles than, than the other way around. I, I mentioned Trans Africa Forum, I mentioned Africa Action. Uh, you, 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 there is a good book by, uh, I really guess there's a good book, I forget the title. But I think it's called uh, Africans in Ghana. It's about, about African Americans uh, by Kevin Gaines. Uh, about African Americans in, uh, in Ghana and, and the contributions. And, and, and you can read about how, for example, when the was assassinated, the African American community in Ghana had protested, right? Uh, you can read about how Maya Angelou again, following the Congo and Shep, you know, the USA. They, uh, they protested the United Nations. But I think, really, and I could be wrong, you know, but from where I stand, it's actually the other way around. It's like African, African, African Americans who historically and in, in, in the present day, who have done more than, you know, and I could argue the ordinary African American walking down the street, uh, but that would be the same as me, you know, walking down the street and not knowing much about that. You're getting about the leadership, they have something done more. In terms of languages, the, the, the division is political, right? The, the division we, 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 we face is, is political. And let me give you a example. Uh, in the 19, late 1950s and early 1960s, Yola and Kuruma were arguing for African unification, right? And you have the Ali Kuruma, you have the Ali Kuruma. The Ali Kuruma was the one who would say, uh, political freedom first, and then economic uh, freedom second. The later Kuruma is one who had realized that, and his argument was that you have to, they have to come together political and economic independence. You know, as we know in Kenya now, and you know, you can't vote, but you can't be. <laughs> you know, so. Um, so, 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 for you can argue for a socialist, for a socialist, united Africa, and you can debate about the merits of that. It was actually the Kenyans, people like John Goya, who vetoed the court actively against that, right? Uh, and you can think about the argument this way. When the Kurumas and Nye yeah, were calling for socialism, uh, it's really like John Goya who stood up and said, uh, no, we don't, need, we don't need socialism because Africa is already socialist, right? They're already vegetarian. In other words, they mystify uh, the whole the whole conversation. But but the division among people is political. You know, suddenly if you talk about languages. If I, and you mentioned it well, you say that language that is well, right? The language, the diverse languages and cultures we understand well. That then we don't mind uh, because uh, because of political decisions being made by the leadership. So that will be my quick response. Okay, thank you for that. Yes, your name and uh, the question, please. My name is my name is Ibrahim. Uh, thank you for the insightful talk and shedding light on the relationship between the whites and uh, the African Americans and how the African immigrants have uh, become a buffer between them. Now, to bring the conversation back home, mm -hmm. we I think. That has taken an, a sort of ethnic, ethnic dimension back home in Kenya, in, in that uh, there are certain communities eh, that have this sense of entitlement because they believe they are the ones who fought for independence. Yeah, and uh, of course, uh, the price has been paid in terms of human lives, and uh, some regions have, of course, paid the economic price. Now, there are leaders from minority tribes who have shown character and uh, leadership that's beyond the reproach. Now my question is, do you think just like the African immigrants uh, became a buffer in terms of their character and everything, do you think electing a leader from these minority groups whose uh, character has been proven and tested would sort of solve Kenya's problems in a way, because of course we know that Kenyan's problems go all the way to the moral fabric. But then you think electing a president who is not from the major tribes that have this sense of entitlement mm. would solve uh, part of Kenya's problems. And then if yes, how then should we drive this conversation? Because you know the mind of the Kenyan voter is sort of polluted with the Mutu syndrome. Thank you. Yeah, I mean that's a really good question. Um, so let me address the first part, right? Okay. So let, let me address the first part. Okay, so I find great irony, right? That they will, let me just you know, lay it out, right? So, so the, the Kenyatta government, the Kenyatta family owns 500,000 acres of land, right? 
And then on top of that, uh, a few years ago, they bought Long Island Mayor's farm, which is 65,000 acres, right? And you can correct me on some of these figures if I'm wrong. Meaning that now they control or they own 565,000 acres of land, right? In the same way, in years we argue why do poor people vote for why did they vote for Trump? Yeah, I think that, that that's a real question here as well. Why would a poor people uh, vote for somebody? Okay, if, if, if you're voting for Uhuru, really what you're saying to Uhuru is, well, when you're getting to power, reduce you to your land. <laughs> you know what I mean? Which, which of course will never do. So, so there is that, um, you know, but when you look at what happened in, in Kenyan history and elsewhere, there was a systematic, uh, a systematic silencing of radical voices that were really offered an alternative. Right? You can start from the 1970s and you can name them. Right? Uh, Mama, <coughs> and Mishu Piyokama Pinto, J.M. Kariuki, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, I mean, it's so, and also a suppression of, of, of third parties. Uh, at any rate, so there, I think let me just wait, so, so there was a systematic silencing of voices that were, that were offered an alternative video for Kenya, that were offered an alternative video for Kenya. Um, and we need that, I think that's what we need. I think we need to find ways of going back to quote unquote radical politics. But it's, it's not even radical politics. There's a, when Steve Biko was asked whether he's a socialist, right? He said, he said, he said he is, for one simple reason, right? That because of the great inequality, that because of the great inequality existing in West Africa, he doesn't see any other way unless there's a form of redistribution of wealth and land. Where in that same situation, I, I don't see how we can build democracy uh, mm -hmm. on inequality. Sometimes I used to use the term uh, democracy with content. Right? So, so I don't know we need, I don't know how, but I do think we need to find our way back to uh, politics that are asking fundamental questions about where we're in the situation we're in, right? Okay, the, the second part of the question. Uh, suddenly, suddenly, first I think, and I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday, about the need to break away from the two-family system, right? Uh, and find a third way, if you will. Now, if, 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 if somebody from a minority group uh, has a, a good platform, uh, by all means, by all means, I think you should support that person. Let me give you an example. In, you know, you can debate about what the politics, you know. But um, I mean, I, I think when she was running, she was the best candidate, right? At least she was cleaner than everybody. And it, I don't take this as an example because I don't get into the nitty gritty of personalities, mm -hmm. right? But people, like, when she got few votes, people were laughing. They were saying, ha, ha, look, she got so few votes, right? So instead of supporting the candidate, you know, certainly there's a question of a trend, she's a woman and so on. But instead of supporting the person with the best platform, uh, we, we fell back on, uh, on ethnic politics. Um, yeah, but we, I think we, we, as a matter of urgency and survival, we have to find a way of, uh, of going back to a politics and asking fundamental questions. Okay, there's one hand there. Any other person? Okay, uh, Malimu. Okay, let's take those two questions. Okay, fine. And Erica, too. Okay, fine. So those three. Okay. Um, my name is David, and I have a question on the this embracing the struggle that Americans go through, the black Americans go through, and the struggle that we as Africans go through. So how easy is it going to be if really we do not face the same challenges like they they, they face this challenge of discrimination as soon as they are in the education system and looking for jobs. But here we we kind of adore the, the white culture and we think that if anyone who's of fairer skin is, is like a good, it's a good outlet. And I, I really want to know how easy it's going to be. Okay, fine. Um, well, I think because that was a tough question, actually. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, can I get it? Thank you. Uh, I'm a little bit confused uh, listening to the, the, the paradox as I have already done. And uh, given the fact that you're looking at it from uh, you know, the new location, mm -hmm. understanding the black America and the struggle, mm -hmm. and therefore you will be able to identify the room who will be very easy to, mm -hmm. to accommodate us from here. 
And again, to me, it looks like uh, the struggle of the political class and the power and the mm -hmm. politics of difference. Mm -hmm. uh, to the extent that uh, a common black American does not really care, doesn't even understand it's uh, mm -hmm. a small country called Kenya. Mm -hmm. And uh, for, for an African here, not yet black American, in fact, you see two images. You see the glorified black uh, uh, um, American mm -hmm. who behave more like white. Mm -hmm. uh, everything they do, they are, they are white. Every uh, a very successful black American end up, end up marrying a white person, mm -hmm. so they become like, more white in their thinking, more mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And at the end of it, you're looking at them wondering exactly when these two connect to Doshia, just like my friend said, they don't share the history, they don't see the similar track. And maybe the only thing that they share in the struggle uh, is, the, um, is the history of struggle, you know, the, the basic needs struggle between your needs. Well, and even if you look at the education, it really doesn't bring the necessity of bringing, of bringing black American as a context. In fact, you know, the lower they are, the, the less significant they are. So how do we connect the two so that at least the black American, you know, the black American can see the significance of the black uh, uh, African and the black African actually see the significance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, so, so the, when, when, I, when I was writing my book uh, on, uh, on Africa and African American, right, I was writing about how I had to learn the language of racism. It's like a language that's usually pick up from, from here, you know, because that meant was that you know that you don't have racism here, and consequently in the US, then I have to learn how to navigate all the sorts of the social code. But then as I was writing, I was thinking, I, I thought, wait a minute, what do I mean, you know, that I have to learn the language of racism? I already know the language of, of ethnicity. Meaning that I can transfer that language. I already know the language of, uh, of racism and tensions between Kenyan and Indians and, 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 and black and so use that term, right? So, so there are ways in which we shouldn't. There are ways in which we shouldn't think that we, we are that different, right? It's, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's also. It's, it, I, I think we need to extend generosity. Actually, we need to extend generosity to each other and also, um, even, and also just do a broad fashion analysis of where we are coming from, right? Um, but certainly colorism, colorism is, is real in the U.S., right? Uh, it, yeah, it's also real here. Um, but, so we, it was another thing we in common. But we can also think about some of the fundamental, you know, questions that you could even argue that are beyond, um, that are, you know, survival. Um, I mentioned, for example, the war on terror, right? So, okay, if you look at it this way, foreign policy affects domestic policy. So, so, for example, the war on terror then comes back. It is what it, 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 you know, if, if in the U.S. and you think, oh, the war, the war on terror goes, it's, it's for people abroad and so on and so forth. But it also comes back with the tightening of laws, draconian measures, and so on and so forth. We think uh, was was becoming increasingly a state. Um, you know, I, I do think all, all people in this, in this case have a, have a stake in debating and rolling back and finding a way for a. Globalization that was very good, not just a few years. You know, and, and, and then of course, they, we are also oppressed as black. There's a, uh, an, an argument from Jerry Eagleton where he was arguing uh, that you fight from where you're oppressed, right? And then you break through that. If you think about intersectionality that has become popular now, you can't be, you can't be born intersectional. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like if you fight from where you are, you, you struggle, if you're being oppressed as a black person, you struggle back as a black person who then uh, gets to that space of inter intersectionalism. So, so there is that, yeah, we also, you know, people, you know uh, when, 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 uh, when Donald Trump talks about shit for African countries, right? I mean, he's also talking about, it, you can hear also the effort of shit for uh, the black American communities and so on and so forth. Uh, but but let, uh, to answer your question, I would say, let's go back to the, because the history is there already. We don't, we don't be writing this. The history is there already. So just that we don't know it. So let's go back and really sit down and relearn uh, this history and we do hope that it will give us instruction on how to move into the future. But without, without doing that, we are not going anywhere. Uh, okay, so the I understood your question was how to break the veil of, 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 of racism, how we see each other and so on and so forth. Um, I, I, I think first that Again, I'll, pass, I'll, I'll go back to generosity, right? You know, so, okay, let me, let me give you an example. An African American comes to, to Kenya, right? 
and our friends who have faced this. They come to Kenya or Tanzania and they're called Muzuru. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, 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 speaking about the spirit of generosity, right? So, can you imagine what that does, right? You know, it's as if you're calling somebody the very own oppressed. And now, there are things that are made that we can zoom in foreigner, but really, there should be more sensitivity, there should be more sensitivity to, to that, that, you know, any, any, so I have, I have friends who come for Sunday abroad programs, we went to Tanzania, they were called Muzungu Muzungu, uh, and eventually, uh, you know, they, they, they left the program halfway, right? So, so let's first begin with that generosity. Um, then also, let, let's look at other examples. You know, Ghana, for example, now has, uh, the, I forget the exact laws, but it's easy as an African American to return. They have had a history of, uh, of, uh, of welcoming African Americans, you know, of, uh, of, it doesn't mean there are any detentions, but like I said, you have had WB Boy Center there. We have a Malcolm X stone here. You know, just a single stone. Um, you know, there's a, uh, the idea of returning in Ghana is very, very real. Uh, and I think you can apply for a Ghanaian passport as a, as a black American, I'm not sure you can check. Um, has Uhuru, and you can correct me on this, has Uhuru ever mentioned police brutality uh, in the US, for example, right? And, 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 and even, once, even for self-interest, even for self-interest because police brutality is affecting black people there as well. I talked about the foreign privilege. But that's when the first thing the coppers will hear your accent. <laughs> you know, otherwise then you're in trouble in this kind of way. You know, so should I protect the, the, the president here also be talking about the Kenyan immigrants there, or the Kenyan first generation there, and also the African Americans there with concerned about racism, just even as a human being, as a human being with power. Um, but but my answer would be the same. Again, let's go back to this history because it's there, it's there, it's, it's you know, it's not even hidden, right? It's just that we have to find it. It's, it's, it's a question of language, I think. So I think it's a question of language. I might myself more comfortable with the lens of racism because I think, that, I think there's more agency, and you can argue with this, right? I think there's more agency. I think you give people more agency and allow them more agency. Uh, I think when you say it through the eyes of white supremacy, then they become automated, right? And you can add semantics, right? Um, but I think when you say we're seeing each other through the eyes of racism, I think there's more agency there. But as somebody said, I was in a conference uh, in November, and somebody said, and we're talking about white privilege. Right? We're talking about white privilege. And somebody threw away my many comments. Yeah, why do you call it white privilege? You know, yeah, I call it white supremacy. So instead of saying I, I benefit from white privilege, say I benefit from white supremacy. You know, and I agree with that as well. So, yeah, okay, I would agree, yeah, yeah in short. Um, how do we break through the mutual miseducation? Again, I, for myself, I cannot stress the importance of, 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 of the history. You know, I cannot stress the importance of that enough because, because, because we don't make ourselves, right? You know what I mean? Like, we don't form ourselves. We, we have inherited this history. It's our, it's our legacy. Um, you know, people have died for it, have struggled for it. Uh, you know, and the knowledge is their image. You know, you have seen talking about how Another way of framing eyes, eyes of racism is also asking the other way around, which is what happens when people who are suffering from double consciousness? You know, so the African is suffering from his own, uh, from his or her own version of double consciousness and the African American. What happens when the two of them meet? Right? But I think, you know, the literature is there, the history is there. I would say let's go back to it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Maybe let's clap for Thank you, Prof, for that, that um, we starting up that conversation, which is quite good. Now, for those of you who need to uh, get to um, ask a question, but I know you have your questions, you can engage Prof on uh, social media. Um, I think his handle is at Mkoma on Google, um, um, on our hashtag, um, hashtag SP, uh, SP Black History. Um, Koma is also a, a, visiting professor, a visiting scholar we have for this semester. And he has an office at the New Century Building, third floor. So if you'd like to engage with him, uh, feel free to visit him or even stop him um, on the road.